Without further ado, then let's uh, move to our next moderator, which is uh, Nicole Mata, who is also a, a member of the, the team that's putting together the, the webinars and the conferences. And Mata, over to you, or Nicole, sorry, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Mehta, and although I'm currently in the event industry, my passion for aviation innovation has grown over the past few years um, from my previous role in at Toronto Pearson Airport, um, and as well as um, gaining the knowledge uh, from Barry and his team, as well as all the wonderful panelists uh, we have here today. So um, our next speaker is from Hamburg, Germany, and is well known in the aviation industry. He is a senior um, aeronautical engineer, expert in flight physics and airship architect. He, is a profound, he has profound knowledge in aerodynamics, flight simulation, and is a big contributor in the airship industry through many facets, including LTA technologies. I am pleased to welcome Johannes Ising to speak to us today on our topic of green airships. Welcome, Johannes. Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, yes, I think... Um, I will be getting a little bit more technical here to the technical side and try to shed some light on the question if a question on how how green are airships actually or why are they supposed to be green let me try and share my screen so how green are airships the question everyone um oh, we often hear that airships are um uh, CO2 emission reduct, uh, reducting uh, technology, and I will try and go into some details. First, I will talk about the flight path 2050 um, and where and why airships can be support, superior. What are obstacles of airship development? That was the question that has been put up in the, in the, in the chat. And what could be a way forward? So, so let's start with the flight path 2050. I am from Europe. Um, flight path 2050 is actually Europe's vision for aviation. And it's the report of the EU high level group on aviation research. And um, the goals or some of the goals for 2050 as compared to 2000 are on one hand uh, safety. So the aim is 80% reduction of the number of accidents for search and rescue missions and manned and unmanned air, air vehicles to safely operate in the same airspace. And it's about emissions. Uh, the aim is 65% reduction of noise emissions, 75% reduction in CO2 emissions, and you see 90% reduction in NOx emissions. And that's quite, uh, quite demanding, uh, but also about cost. So the aim is to reduce cost and certification um, about 50%. So how to do this? Can, can airships contribute there? And yeah, so why, why, why can airships be superior? So here I will be talking about lighter than air. What is this? What is efficiency? What is safety? And what is cost? These were the points issued by Flight Path 2050. So what is this? If we hear the word aircraft, most of us would think about a thing, flying thing with wings, an airplane. But aircraft is, is a more general term. It includes heavier than air um, aircraft. Let me get the laser pointer here. Heavier than air aircraft, also called aerodynes, which are fixed wing aircraft and rotor wing aircraft or helicopters. And we have lighter than air aircraft like aerostats, also called LTA for lighter than air. Here we have balloons that are the oldest contraptions that fly. And then we have airships or dirigibles. So a dirigible is basically a balloon that can be steered. Most of you will know that the Wright brothers, uh, so some historical background, right? Uh, but also performance wise, that the Wright brothers uh, did fly in December 1903 uh, in Kitty Hawk for some 59 seconds uh, over a distance of 20, 260 meters. And not so many do know that uh, two years earlier, Alberto Santos Dumont did a controlled powered flight uh, with a duration of 13 minutes and a range of 15 kilometers. And he was doing this standing and wearing a proper hat actually. So the first Atlantic crossing was said uh, to be, had, had been done in June 1919 by John Alcock and Arthur uh, Whitham Brown, his navigator. He did cross the Atlantic west to east. And in the very same year, just one month later, Major George Herbert Scott crossed the Atlantic with 31 crew 
east west and back east and underway they found whoops we have a blind passenger and whoops we have a cat that was then called whoopsie so um, further achievements are, uh, for example, the L-55 that did fly in 1917 to an altitude of 7,600 meters, or uh, the well-known the well-known Africa ship, the L-59, that did fly the same year for 95 hours, um, nonstop, unrefueled for 6,757 kilometers, carrying 50 tons of useful load. So I will come to the definition of useful load later. And uh, so concerning um, payload or useful load and, and range, this has been achieved by fixed wing aircraft some 40 years later, for example, by the Douglas DC 132 cargo master. But everyone would say, okay, an airplane is faster. How can this be compared? And this is where I will try and explain a little bit about efficiency or transport efficiency. So efficiency basically is the ratio of gain to effort. And gain being here per activity, what is useful load times speed. This is like a mass flow in a pipeline, for example. It's measured in ton kilometers per hour because time matters, of course. And the, the power you need to do this, to provide this productivity in terms of engine power. And I used installed power because uh, you find, it's easy to find data on useful load on speed and then installed power of different aircraft. So if you go and plot some data, so let me explain this plot here. I here have the productivity in ton kilometers per hour. It's on a logarithmic, logarithmic scale. Um, and this is plotted versus uh, installed engine power in, in horsepower. So here we have some fixed wing aircraft. This is uh, the Airbus A500M, the C-130 Hercules, and this is the Transal, I think. And you see, okay, here is a trend. So for a certain amount of installed power, you get some productivity in return. And so these are military transport airplanes, okay? With propellers. So if I um, compare these with helicopters, a rotary wing aircraft can be seen, of course, there's uh, no big wonder um, for the same installed power. If we go up this line here for the same installed power, you get only about one fourth of productivity from a helicopter. This is because helicopters are slower and they are less efficient, but let us not forget they are capable of vertical takeoff and landing, what is quite a capability. So then people have tried and do something in between tilt rotors, for example, that's a mix of a rotary wing aircraft and a fixed wing aircraft. And yes, they are faster. And yes, they are more efficient because they have wings, but they are very heavy, right? Because uh, this complex technology takes uh, um, a lot of, of uh, uses a lot of weight actually. And this is then missing in the, uh, in the useful weight and the useful load. So where do we have airships in this plot? This is here, very much more to the left, so much lesser uh, installed power. So, and how can we read this plot? If we go on this line here, like for the same productivity we have here for fixed wing aircraft, we need only one third of installed power to provide this productivity, right? Or we also can say, com uh, comparing it to helicopters. So with the same installed power, I can offer 10 times more productivity. So, and this of course has, and I will come to this later, just to be very blunt, uh, this efficiency you see at helicopters is rather bad, but let's not forget, they can do vertical takeoff and landing. And um, so the efficiency of fixed wing aircraft is of course better. They are faster and they have wings, and are more, they are more efficient, but still this all can be topped for low speed missions by uh, airships. So I won't go into details here. It's just to tell you that yes, there are numbers behind this. And I have some fixed wing aircraft, uh, three tilt wing aircraft, three rotary wing aircraft or helicopters like here, the NH-19 or the Sky Crane and some airships ranging from the Hindenburg to the Africa ship that I showed before. And it's amazing that this very old technology is looking so good compared to contemporary aviation technology. So safety, 
let's spend a few words on safety. Airships feature the so-called balloon mode. So an airship pilot I work with said, don't use the E word in case of an all engines out incident, this is not an emergency. So while in an airplane, if you have an all engines out, you have to know what to do right away and you have to know your procedures and everything while in an airship, when all engines are, are out or inoperative, it's basically like, oh, all the engines are out. Let me get the flight manual and look up what to do. So this is certification wise uh, quite, um, quite a thing. And so if an airship comes down, it comes down very slowly. So it falls slowly and this has an, uh, uh, an impact, let me say, on impact energy. So if it hits the ground and this is like the ground risk that is to be taken into account when uh, you do a risk assessment, the impact energy is, is relatively low for airships. And uh, airships are large, airships are slow. So the visibility is uh, very good. Um, that means particularly if you look at uh, UAS or UAVs, they can be seen very early, early on, for example, by fast flying uh, rescue helicopters or, or so. So in this case, size does matter. And downwash. So um, airships have almost no downwash, right? And this is much, much safer for passengers, sometimes called PAX or PAX, and also for ground crew. Cost. So how expensive is an airship? I won't pro provide numbers here, just uh, um, directions. So if you look at certification costs um, and you compare a computer airplane and a commuter airship, the airworthiness requirements and Europe called CS for certification specifications. This is what in the US would be like the FAR part 23 or part 25 for transport airplanes has about 420 pages and the equivalent document for airships has about 80 pages, right? This is, means less paragraphs, less work, less costs. And for transport airplanes, it's, it's a very similar, let me say. So yes, you have to prove that your airship is airworthy, um, that you have taken into account all the risks, but uh, because of the inherent safety of the balloon mode, it's much easier. And um, DOC, direct operating cost and engines. So engines are like a lion's share in uh, operating costs for, for airplanes because they are a lion's share in acquisition cost. And so they are a, share, a big share in depreciation, part of the direct operating cost, less engine, less maintenance and less fuel burn, of course. And I forgot to say here that we also have, of course, less emissions. Airships are flying low and slow and uh, speed and altitude being cost drivers. Flying at low altitude, you do not need oxygen systems and you do not need cabin pressurization, both being um, um, adding to cost, of course. And at low speeds, you have a low dynamic pressure, a low aerodynamic pressure, lower aerodynamic loads, lower inertia loads, and Mach effects. Well, no, we don't have Mach effects with airships. So uh, this eases development quite a bit. What are obstacles for airship development? So first of all, I have here speed. I just said speed is a benefit, but uh, it also means that airplanes and helicopters are faster and passengers, PAX packs are time critical cargo. They don't like to wait to be them. You are on a, uh, on a tourist flight, on a, on a scenic sightseeing, sight, uh, seeing flight or something, then you want to fly slow. Um, but for passenger transportation, it's, it's, it is slow, yes. And uh, yes, you need infrastructure. You need a hangar for um, assembly and maintenance and repair. You need a mass not for every load exchange, right? So a load exchange without a mast has been shown. It's common practice actually, but you need a mast if you want to park your airship somewhere outdoors, not in a hangar. You need helium supply, and of course, you need try you need trained ground crew. So not every airport provides these means. So uh, concerning speed, to the right hand side, you see the Carmen Gabrielli um, diagram showing our three uh, friends here, the emojis, helicopters, um, having a relatively high tractive, specific tractive force, like, like a resistance or drag. And uh, speed-wise, they are just in the middle between airplanes and airships. Uh, airplanes, again, being faster, being more efficient, 
but airships here are somewhere between like cruise ferries and trains efficiency wise and yes they are a little slower but still faster than ships and trucks other obstacles are prejudices so um what I always hear is but the side wind, you know, you have these large lateral area and if there is a wind and everything, well, airships usually, usually do not fly sidewards. So as a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, airships do not do crosswind starts and landing like, uh, like airplanes do, like here where you fly in a crab approach and then do your decrab and then finally wind or here you are exposed to side wind. You don't have this, for example, with the Zeppelin NT. And then, uh, but they are so slow. Okay, so airships are certified to withstand wind speeds on the mast of 17 knots. That is equivalent to Beaufort 12 or a very severe storm. So 70 knots is hence a common top speed for airships. It does not make sense in my humble opinion to go much faster because the loads are higher. That means that uh, the structure is heavier. You has, have less uh, useful load and also you burn much more uh, uh, fuel because the power demand goes up with the cube of speed. So, and then you always hear about the Hindenburg exploded. So all the airworthiness requirements that I know, or most, um, have a paragraph saying the lifting gas must be non-flammable. So why, while uh, hydrogen is of course being discussed, of course, and most authorities would say we are not emotional, we are willing to debate here, um, it's much easier to have. Helium, and then coming back to the Hindenburg, uh, 62 out of the 79 persons on board actually survived. Another obstacle is reinvention of the wheel. So we have a lot of uh, excessively heavy airships. We have lenticular airships being reinvented again and again and again and again. And we have variable buoyancy airships, also a matter of frequent reinvention, while airships actually did fly in World War One under flag and proved uh, quite airworthy. So what could be a way forward? I will be talking here shortly, briefly about uh, LTA UAVs or UAS, uh, about fuel gas, fuel cells, photovoltaics, HAPs, and the DELEC. LTA UAVs, so I, these are three projects I was involved with. And if you do a risk assessment, a SORA, what is a special operations risk assessment, what you need to do if you want to fly commercially or scientifically with an airship, you find, wow, an airship is very safe, right? And uh, this is why it's relatively easy to get a permit to flight and to fly even over a populated area. And on top, airships provide endurance. So this is why we see more and more airship UAVs. And Fuel gas, yeah, like nine years ago, the Graf Zeppelin flew around the world on fuel gas or blau gas, how, uh, how they call it. They flew with 30 tons of fuel with uh, more or less no weight. Of course, it had weight, but it uh, provided its own buoyancy, so it does not fall down, so it has no weight. And this is a total redefinition of the energy density, a total redefinition of the Breguet range uh, equation. And if you fly with biogas, you have your airship even greener. So fuel says just briefly, uh, I saw we had some um, people from Kelwin in the audience here. This is also projects I have heavily been uh, involved in. They are flying with a fuel cell and with hydrogen as a lifting gas because they said, hey, if we fly with a fuel cell to enhance our endurance and we have to deal with, um, with hydrogen anyway, why not using hydrogen then also as a lifting gas? And this is a, a quite innovative approach. I, I really like it. So thumbs up for Kelu. Photovoltaics is, uh, yes, airships do have a large surface area. That means photovoltaics gets very interesting. Um, on BLIMS, we have the, the trouble, let me say, or the issue, the challenge that the photovoltaic panels get very hot and the heat affects the envelope material and also the lifting gas superheat. So if you would put photo, photovoltaics on a rigid airship, I think this has not been done so far, as far as I'm aware, the outer cover of, of a rigid airship is actually secondary structure and the, there's an air insulation layer between the outer cover and the gas cells. So very briefly on high altitude pseudo satellites, um, there are quite a few uh, projects around. I have been involved here in, uh, in ECOSAT Spain. 
and um, coming to the DELEC. So I'm uh, not only a member of the Airship Association, a council member, I'm also a member of the Germany-based Aerarium um, Registered Nonprofit Association. So this is what EV is, stands for. So Aerarium is promoting lighter than air technology since the 90s. And it runs a couple of project labs on lighter than air uh, systems. It does uh, remotely controlled flight tests and it provides a scientific airship UAV for an external customer. And it has two working groups. One is aero modeling. So we are doing an um, FAI rated international competitions and it has a working group DELEC. So I'm running out of time, I see. Um, so DELEC, uh, the, the aim of the DELEC working group is to establish the registered airship owner cooperative DELEC. So what is for Deutsche Luftschiff Eingetragene Genossenschaft, it's a registered uh, cooperative. And the business case is to have airships built, certified and maintained externally to own these airships and to lease them out to airship operators. So the airship we are looking at is a commuter category that is below 15 tons, maximum takeoff weight, 19 passengers. It's a classical rigid structure, but with enhanced maneuverability. And our benchmark is the SF-120 Bodensee that has been operated commercially. And the strategy is to um, Ararium to establish the TRL process. TRL is for technical readiness level to derive a solid business plan from this and to establish the registered cooperative. The status is we have established the TRL process for our product, for our idea, and Erarium is working on the TRL1 review, and we will be presenting on maneuverability at the Delta S conference in Mumbai in June 2022. So summing up the presentation for missions requiring, requiring low and slow, flying low and slow, vertical takeoff and landing, zero downwash, and low noise, airships can actually answer flight path 2050 goals for reducing emissions drastically to increase safety and to save costs. Thank you.